All right, hi, this is period A. I'm talking to the video here also because Donovan's not here and anyone else who wants to see this again. Okay, so what we have here, uh, this is something we'll encounter in chemistry as well. It is a uh, pink substance. Um, actually, it was a clear liquid, a clear colorless liquid that I added something to. You may have encountered this before. Uh, it is a base. So what is a base the opposite of? An acid. So you got acids on this side and bases on this side. I've added, um, this is a base, sodium hydroxide. Waylon, Rashi, you guys with me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So um, I've added an indicator. The indicator is called phenolphthalein. It's hard to spell. Phenolphthalein. But what it does is when something is basic, it turns it, uh, it, turns it pink. All right? So what we have here, and this one is pink. Actually, I didn't add the phenolphthalein, but when you see, I just did a practice of this yesterday, and then it turned my, my stuff pink. But it's still basic. So what I have here is uh, some little blocks of jelly. This jelly is called agar. Okay, uh, and I got one little, not exactly a cube. I'm gonna try and get a cube one actually. So one small cube. Um, and agar is just a, a gel, a jelly. If you've ever seen like those uh, when they've been testing for like um, micro, uh, like bacteria and stuff like that, they have petri dishes with jelly in it, and that's what they usually use to grow. It's a thing that they can grow stuff on. But in this case, it's being used as an excuse to um, have a jelly that stuff can get into. Uh, but not super fast. So things are going to diffuse into this jelly. I'm going to drop it into this uh, solution, not drop it from a great height, but I'm going to put it in the solution, and we're going to see um, how fast the stuff that I have in here, the sodium hydroxide, gets into this agar, okay, this jelly. But the thing that's going to tell us whether it got in or not is guess what? It's going to it's going to turn pink because uh, this agar has been made with phenolphthalein in it. So it was like a jello that we made and we put some extra indicator in it. So as stuff goes in here, it should turn pink on the outside right away, right? Because as soon as it hits the base, it's going to turn pink right away. It's got phenolphthalein in it. But as the, as the uh, uh, sodium hydroxide penetrates it and gets deeper into it, over time, we're going, to send, send, we're going to let this go for 10 minutes. And we're going to see, we'll cut it open after and see how far it got in. All right. The point of this um, and I'd like you guys to think on this for tonight, is, is we talked yesterday about how things, well, why don't you tell me? Cells. Has, what does it have to do with cells? Yeah. Something like mitosis and division. Well, we talked about division, right? But we talked about why do things need to divide. Hannah? Probably like diffusion. Yeah. Too much concentration in one area and less of like to So that's why diffusion happens, yes. So like there's no sodium hydroxide in here right now. And the sodium hydroxide on the outside is going to be like, ooh, there's, no, there's none of me in there. I'm going to get in there. That's what is the pressure causing diffusion to happen. Uh, yes, Emma? Um, when, if the cell is too big, then mm. the nutrients don't reach the nucleus okay. of the cell. Or anywhere, like, all the way in, right? So this is going to be a, an example of a small cell. I've got a larger cube. Larger cube. Dun, 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 even larger cube. Okay, so three sizes of cube. We're going to drop all, not drop, we're going to place gently all three of these cubes in. We're going to give them 10 minutes. This is a fairly low uh, concentration of sodium hydroxide, by the way. So it's just going to, you know, sort of seep in there. And then in 10 minutes, we're going to cut them open and see how far did that sodium hydroxide get into all three of them. But I'd like you to keep in mind the idea of if this was a cell, or if this was a cell, and they're trying to get things into their from their environment, if they're a certain size, are they going to get it all over themselves and all throughout their cells better if they're small versus if they're really big? Make sense? Oh, yeah. So now we're going to do this. Does someone have a timer on their phone? Because I have my fingers are covered yeah. in stuff. This stuff. Ten minutes? Ten minutes, please. So as we do it, we should see them go bright pink right away. So let's see. And go. Okay, so we'll let them go. See what happens. Wait, is that thing hard or is it soft? It's, 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 uh, it's like jelly t texture. It's like, it's like really, uh, you know, sometimes it, like, you can have runny jello and you can have jello that's been like it's too tough. This is like tough jello. You know that jello? 
Yeah. You're like that. Gel. Yes. Yeah, some hospital gel is like that. All right. So there we go. We'll let this run for ten minutes. Cool. Meantime, uh, let's talk about questions. What about this thing? Yeah. Uh, you can take a note. Doesn't hurt. Uh, but. What? Yeah, I guess not. Do I have raccoon face? A little bit. Whoa. I already kind of gave you a little bit. It's, it's not much to say. go through the questions when we get there and we'll just answer them together. All right, so um, first question was about uh, the DNA being a universal code. Uh, can somebody hit me with that one? Sajal. Because the DNA of all living organisms is made up the same genetic code. So yeah, the same, uh, the same bases. So the language that DNA is written in, A, C, T, and G, is the same. And also the way that proteins are built uses the same um, set of, of codes. So they're all reading things the same way. The ribosome works no matter whether you're a bacterium or whether you're a human or an antelope, whatever. Uh, now, the, does that mean the pro proteins are going to be the same? No. The information could be different, but the code for it is the same. So it's like a set of software that you can put in on Mac or PC or or Linux or whatever, like it'll work in all systems. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a computer science teacher. Okay. So, um, does that make sense? What about RNA, though? You have different bases, right? Um, well, RNA, yeah, RNA is another system that is, uh, but it also would be universal as well. The RNA is going to be the same. Uh, you could have a, a note about, like, what, what's, the, what's the role of RNA? The RNA is sort of the in between point between DNA and, and, and proteins. Okay. Uh, why is the nucleus of a cell so important? Mohanad, what do you think? Okay, good. So it, can do, it does the controlling of the activities, and, and why is it able to do that? What does it have in it that allows it to do that? Good, good. So it contains, it contains the DNA, the genetic material. controls those operations of the cell by turning genes on and off, by, by causing certain proteins to be made, um, 
So the brains of the operation, though, are all that DNA that's contained inside the nucleus. Number two, simple diagram of a portion of a DNA molecule and the indication, uh, location of a gene. So if you want to go from the chromosome level, that's fine. Um, if you drew a whole chromosome. And we said, we said yesterday, actually, that in a way, this is how we normally see chromosomes, but really a chromosome is actually one half of that. And yes? I just drew the DNA. Yeah, so in here, within this, there'd also be a DNA section. So you could just do a little close-up of that, make yourself a little D DNA double helix here, and say that, well, this here could be a gene. Now, this wouldn't really be to scale, though, because a gene is going to be on the order of maybe, uh, let's say, 50,000 base pairs or so. Right here, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, about 10. So it would have to be a much longer se sequence, but just the idea of a section of DNA that has information for one protein would be a gene. Okay. Oh, it's 50,000. I mean, yeah, they're, they're quite large, but not as large as all the DNA. How are we doing for time? Almost there? Um, three minutes remaining. Three minutes remaining, okay. And you said that um, gene is only like 1% of the DNA, um, so all the genes, yeah, I mean, there's estimates of around, like, 1% of the DNA is actually coding for things. That estimate so goes up and down. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes it's called junk DNA, sometimes it's called, uh, there's lots of other, there's lots of things. The rest, yeah. Sometimes it's leftovers from old things. Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. I don't think that's ethical. You've run into an ethical issue. You could, you could, yes. Oh, look, it's our board. Um, number three. So we're doing a little T-chart. DNA screening, positive and negative. Oh, um, positive, you can discover diseases that you have. Okay, so um, and try to can be modified. Okay, so maybe if there was a therapy, like a gene therapy, that would enable you to change that, perhaps. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Jenna? It reduces the stress of uncertainty. Reduces uncertainty. It's very small, sorry. My T-chart's too small for my handwriting. Yes, Nina? Um, you can figure out if you have any mutations. Okay. Oh. Or if you're prone to things. You can also figure that out. One minute left. Thank you. I'm going to just put a pause on this for a second. You can decide whether to have kids too. Ah, okay, so that, that could help you decide uh, about procreating, if that's, if that's an idea for you or whether it's a bad idea. Good. So take a look just uh, at this. Mr. Lou? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Why do you need the uh, well, it's base, and I don't want to get it in my face. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. I thought so. Ah. Thirteen. Thirteen. It's okay, Sajal. It happens all the time. Yeah. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Okay. Thank you. So, in the same way that when you're boiling your broccoli, if you want to stop it from cooking, uh, you might run it under some water. I'm going to pour some water on this just to stop it from absorbing or get it off the surface. Is it stuck on the bottom? Oh, it's stuck. 
Well, Very handy. Maybe they're all really good. They're making more gorgeous. Now you have to cut it. Okay. The transformation is standard. Large. Medium. I think this is medium. This looks like small, actually. Okay. Small. And there you are. I feel like the medium is less pink than the long. Okay. Yes, they do, but they are not beets. So do not eat. They are fake. They are yeah, I'm actually going to go get a little blade for this. I'm going to go get a blade. Be right back. Okay. Did you wash it? I washed my knife, yes. All right. So we'll start with the uh, the smallest one first. It's not exactly a knife, but it's sort of a knife. That's a satisfying video. That's a satisfying video. Okay. So... For the video here, yeah. So you can see it's pretty much gone all the way through. If you can, can't see that from very far back there, you can come take a look at it after. Okay. Number two. Ooh, look at that. There's a little white center. That means it didn't go all the way through in ten minutes. Okay. And finally... Very nice. I feel like this should be a cooking show. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Don't eat that. It contains sodium hydroxide for one. Phenolphthalein also poison. One might be able to, but there you go. So if you want to come up and take a close look, you can check it out. Um, so cool. They all have white centers, though. Yep, so that one has didn't get all the way through, but it's closer, though. There's more of it yeah. has absorbed. Is it fun what to cut? I don't know what it would be. It is. I want to just cut a bunch. Oh, there's more of that. Those are my test ones for yesterday. Oh, no. Cut those. I want to see what happens. Oh. That reminds me of the jellos inside those jellos. Did it go all the way through the test one? Eventually. It's been, I mean, this was last night, so. Yeah, that's the last night. Yep. All right, so you can take a look over here if you like. I'm in your video. Oh, no. Hi, Goji. Okay. You're a star now. So there you go, though. That's absorption and diffusion. You should have done it with Oedipus. What do you mean it looks pretty legit? Of course it's legit. No, it's fake. No, it's, it's fake. Fake science. I want to cut this jelly. Okay. I'll leave it here. You can come check it out later. But um, so that last point there was it could inform your decision to reproduce. So if you uh, if you have um, a condition with a very strong correlation to a disease, you may decide uh, not to reproduce. That looks like like a yeah. hubba bubba. You know, like yes. No. Thanks for asking though. All right. So uh, downsides. Yes, Matthew. So, like, what if you go further and you really love? Like, the last thing I'm like, breast cancer, 
Or like some kind of genetic predisposition, yeah. Yeah, and you're like, ah, well, Yeah, okay, so it could be, um... You could, that could be emotionally distressful if you have a partner, or if it's you as well, who has, when you, you find out... You could depression. It could be very distressing and very, in different ways, exactly. Um, so, on the one hand, there's the benefit of knowing... But that comes also with consequences. And uh, now, Emotional. the other thing too is that some. Okay, well, I'll I'll leave that to, for the moment. Yes, Jenna Ngoji. Could be expensive. So um, that's an access issue, right? So uh, you you can get that knowledge if you can afford it, but maybe not everybody can afford it. Yep. They have a, a risk of pregnancy loss. Okay, so uh, just sort of byproducts of the testing itself. Um, so the test itself might have some risks. Yep. Um, it, it could be like if there was no cure. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if there's no cure, um, it's pretty useless. It could be uh, yeah again emotionally distressing to find out that you have a condition. That may uh, kill you. Yeah, yeah. Now that said, um, it should be noted that some of these diseases are uh, give you a predisposition. And some people want to know so then they can live their life differently. Yeah, you might you might uh, manage your expectations for your life for sure. Now this this word is very important. I'm going to turn this over here. Predisposition. This word gets thrown around a lot in terms of genetics and diseases. So quiet down. When they say you have a genetic predisposition to something, that means that you have, you know, there's an increased likelihood for you to have a condition based on your genes. Okay? That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that you're going to have that condition. So not all genetic things are like destiny in the sense that they're, they're going to definitely lead to a consequence. Some of them have a much stronger connection. So if you have this gene, you definitely have this disease, and it's definitely going to have these consequences. Some things, there are, uh, are, are, are the certainty is very high. But if you have a predisposition to something, that means you have a possibility and a, and a higher likelihood, but not necessarily a certainty of getting a condition. Um, this is also why they ask you about family history. Your doctor will ask you, does anybody in your family have heart disease, stroke, diabetes, things like that? These are things that they can then say, all right, well, if you have it on both sides of your family, you know, you have a higher risk of it for yourself. That increases your genetic predisposition. Without even doing this genetic screening, they can still, just looking at your family history, say, meh, your risk is higher for this and this and this. All right? So these are, these are things about probability. Did I spell that right? Probability and risk. So whether you actually get a genetic test for DNA screening or you look at your family history uh, to determine your predisposition for things, it's about managing your expectations and your risk level uh, for certain things. Does that make sense? So um, reducing uncertainty, you know, again, it'll give you a it'll give you an idea about certain things, but it's still, there's, there's often a level of chance still that you might not get it or you, things like that. Um, okay. Thank you. Oh, one other thing too I'd like to throw out there is, and this one gets talked about a lot uh, in terms of like 23andMe and those kinds of, uh, um, when you're giving your DNA to a company or, you know, whoever's doing it, suddenly they've got your entire set of genetic information, uh, privacy. can become a big concern. Yeah, what are they going to do with that information? Are they going to share it with people? Uh, insurance companies, for example, might want to know if you are going to have, if you've got a gene that's going to maybe give you a higher risk for something there. Insurance is all about probabilities and determining how much money should be charged you for your insurance. 
Well, I mean, they do the best they can, right? And when you when you receive insurance money, it's like, yeah, I'm glad I got insurance. But on the other side of it, sometimes it can be uh, there's it's it cuts both ways. Insurance. Double edged sword. Double edged sword, indeed. Okay. So privacy, insurance prices, those are kinds of things that people can cite as uh, potentially negative uh, consequences. Also, discrimination, right? What if your uh, what if your boss found out that you might have a, a, a gene for a specific disease, or you're applying for a job, and they're like, "Well, let me see your DNA first. and then they're like, "Yeah, no, nah, I, I don't." It's it's got a good thing, but like this is this is the fear that we have of like of your information being used in negative ways. So that's uh, so let's say employment insurance, etc. Well, that they don't say it yet, but they, you know, we don't want them to. Do you know the book Genetically Different? I don't. Okay. Good book. I don't know. I saw it at a bookstore. It was cheap, so I was like, I want to buy it. I'll check it out. It's like, why, why can we change our genes? Ah, okay. Yeah. Let me know. Let me know. All right, number eight. What is a mutation? Would a mutation that caused a deer to be albino, what's albino again? White, white, white. Like basically no pigmentation, yep. Yeah. Be uh, beneficial, harmful, or neutral. If the deer lives in a zoo, would your answer change? Explain. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's start with Matthew and then Nick. Yes, Matthew. Okay, so if the deer was in the wild and it was albino, yep. especially in like the forest area, like, I would be like really, really easy. Yeah, it probably wouldn't last very long. That would probably be like a baby deer getting got. Yeah, yeah in, in captivity, much, much more likely that it's going to be okay. And this is why the environment is so important. The, the, the particular place where, uh, where something lives, if it gets a mutation, again, just to go from the beginning, what is a mutation? Just uh, can I get somebody to answer that question quickly? Yeah. That's when a mutagen physically um, changes... The DNA and the genetic code in terms of the base pairs. Okay, good. Usually a mutation. Yeah. So, mutation. Yeah, but they mean the past they have. The list is here. That was the gold direction. All right, so any change in DNA is a mutation, whether it's uh, through copying errors or through uh, mutagens, um, various things can cause it to happen. Yes, uh, Bella. I think that maybe like, if, if it's in a zoo, like, it could be beneficial because, like, because, ah. like, if it's in a zoo, it's rare, so, like, okay. people would probably want to see it more, so then, like, the animal might get, like, a nicer... Better, uh, better circumstances? Yeah, Interesting, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, and then actually they might be like, well, let's breed some more of these yeah. albino... A deer and the drama albino park. Deer trading. The albino deer trading. I've never heard of an albino deer. Well, they don't do so well in the wild, as it turns out. Unless maybe they, you know, are born in, you know, snowy conditions, and suddenly, you know, they, they actually have a better chance of, of um, or if if they lived in a place where that actually causes them better camouflage, it could be good for them. So I'm just gonna quickly jot down a few of these things. Um, likely. Likely harmful. Um, easy, easy prey. Good. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So likely harmful decreases their camouflage, makes them easy prey. Uh, Nick, did you have a one? Oh, same, same, same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alex, did you have a thing? Well, I just said it depends on the conditions. Depends on the conditions. Now, deer in general are living in conditions where the way they look has been adapted, like they've adapted to that way of looking, to have a good, you know, camouflage and, and defense, which is why they're hard to see. Uh, so yeah, um, if if they happen to be in good conditions for this particular albinism, great, but likely they're going to have trouble because they don't fit into the surroundings. Uh, Emma Nina Goji. 
So, um, you know how there's Arctic foxes? Arctic foxes. Um, so they're white because they um, adapt to each other in their environment, mm -hmm. but isn't it technically a, uh, they're technically albino and it's a mutation? Um, it's probably a similar them? mutation that, like, uh, oh, either it's albinism or just they they have decreased the amount of pigmentation they have or the color of their fur to, you know, over time be as light as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so if the deer, the albino deer was in, in the winter, it'd be beneficial? It might be okay for that season. As soon as it got, as soon as the, the snow melted, though, it might run into trouble. Yeah. So, uh, but what we'll just say depends on surroundings. So it's likely that it's not going to blend in very well, though. Uh, Nina, and then Goji, and then Alice. Yeah. Uh, then having an albino deer, though, might be like an ethical issue as much as it is like breed them and sell them. Oh, like if in, like, if, yeah. Yeah, because then they'd be like super inbred, because like you said, they're pretty rare. There's probably only one or two. A couple of them, so. yes. So you could lead to some, That's, some yeah. breeding problems. It would yeah. be like breeding, you know, dogs. funny dogs also. Yeah, they do lead to increased recessive traits. Isn't there like, like uh, what about melanistic? It's the opposite of albinistic. Basically. So it's oh. black. Yeah, they're just black. Like darker? Like every color yeah. is black. It's just so if they increase their melanin too, it could if if they still stand out in their surroundings, it's either way, it's not a good thing for them. It's melanistic. Instead of albinistic, where there's no pigment, it's just like too much pigment. Uh, I think there was like a dog. That was it. Uh, I'll get a picture of something to call Okay, so um, just to come back to it, Goji, yeah, sorry. Ah, it might be rejected by its peers if it's, uh, you know. Um, yeah, hopefully there's no, like, yes, no discrimination in the deer community, but it's possible, you know, we don't know about deer it's like culture, a right? There's Who that knows? story with, like, with, there's a family of ducks and there's one that's black, like the ugly duckling. Aha, the ugly duckling? Yeah. That was weird. Different spaghetti. Yeah. I mean, in French, it, it's just a black duckling. So, so, in the natural environment, probably a, likely a harmful mutation, in the zoo, maybe uh, maybe beneficial, might get it some perks, or at least neutral. Uh, yeah, Alex, then, oh, sorry, uh, Jenna, who was first? I forget. I think Alex. Alex, and then Jenna. Thank you. Uh, so, I guess, like, albino, yeah. it's just basically, it's a mutation. Like, as I said before, you have certain genes I coded for saying, like, if you do have the color, and then mm -hmm. you have, like, oh, what color are you going to have mm -hmm. based on the inheritance? So basically means you don't have, you're not, like, albino means you're not going to have any color regardless, like, mm. but you might still have, like, the color black fur, but it's just going to say, well, you're not supposed to have color in the first place, so then it's not going to produce those black, like, pigments. So it's just going to affect, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say, like, the mechanism of alb albinism uh, I, I, I'm not a specialist in it, I'm not sure exactly, but it, it would just change, like, uh, what you're saying is, what are you saying? Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch the whole point. Because if you have, you have two, like, kind of, like, system, like, you have a system. Yeah. So if you have a gene that, like, codes for a color, let's say, yeah. oh, like, I'm going to have, like, blonde hair. Okay. And that's going to be, like, a gene. Okay. Then you're going to say, you're going to have another gene that's going to say, oh, are you going to have color? And if that, then what is that color going to be? Mm -hmm. Oh, that color is going to be blonde, so I'm going to produce blonde. Oh, I see. Like, so there's, there's one for, do we turn on these color... Yeah, things at all, and then if if so, which colors do we turn on, and so on? Yeah. So if albinism is just a whole switch that turns the whole color system off, basically. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Jenna. I was gonna say, can albinism. Albinism. Yeah. Yeah, I can say. Ever be like a sign of any other like underlying genetic conditions? Because I know I remember watching this documentary once about this girl who that was like she had it when she was born, mm -hmm. and as she started getting older, she started having other symptoms. Mm hmm. And, like, she started going blind. And oh, really? She ended up well, up as an autoimmune disorder. Okay. And it was albinism was one of the first, like, hmm. telltale signs of it. So, does uh, that ever occur in, like, animals? Uh, I'm not sure. Like I said, I'm not an, an expert on it. But, I mean, I know for, like, Roy Orbison, for example, the musician. Uh, anybody heard of Roy Orbison? No. No? Oh, yeah. 
Roy Orbison? Yeah, he's um, like our singer, right? Uh, yeah, he was a singer back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, early rock and roll guy. But he was an albino. Uh, he, 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 he colored his hair black, but he, uh, he had glasses and all the time, sunglasses all the time because he had very sensitive eyes, no pigment, right? So uh, um, he's always wearing sunglasses. Um, but uh, yeah, he was albino. And I think it affected his vision as well. I'm not sure what the correlation is. Uh, that's something we can look up if you like. Figure out about albinism. But yeah. Um, Someone's bell. bell. Soul bell. Oh. Yes. All right. So uh, that's the big take home I want you to get, though, from this, is that the, that the environment that a thing lives in is going to determine whether an, a mutation is beneficial, harmful, or neutral. Okay. So let's um, take a look at this, uh, this worksheet. I'm just going to walk through some of these questions. Most of you don't have the actual worksheet, but we'll just uh, talk through it a bit. You may recall as we talk about it. So the first one... Uh, yeah, when constructing the DNA molecule, what did you notice about the two strands? About the orientation of the two strands. So, um, like, your two strands of, the, of your DNA model over here. Okay, so what do we notice about the orientation about them? Yes, Mr. Uh, job. Yeah, this one's sort of going up this way, and this one's going down this way. So they're in opposite directions. Okay, um, one word they sometimes use for that is anti-parallel. So this would be if they were going the same direction. Can we just say opposite? They're parallel, and they're and they're parallel in the same direction. And this is anti-parallel; they're going in the opposite direction. Or you can just say. They're going in the opposite direction. But there is definitely a direction about them, right? Which is why when we were in the hallway doing that the first time, I had one group facing one way down the hall and the other group was facing the other way. That's was to show that. Um, then this thing here, this was the backbone. This is the phosphate, the sugar, and the base over here. Uh, define replication. Some people I don't hear from, so I just want to give people a chance. Someone, someone we don't hear from too often. Nick, okay. Something like duplicates itself, so it's like the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So the making of two copies of of this whole thing on both sides would be replication. This is the single one, and then you could have a new one made from the 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 using each side as a copy, or as a template. Identical. Hmm, sorry? As a, they'd be identical, yes. Or at least they should be. Okay, um, so here we have a, um, a DNA strand, and it looks like this. Um, G, sorry, T, G, G, A, C, C. And we also had the sugar, and then a phosphate, okay, so on the other side, we have sugar, 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 what's the name of the sugar again? Deoxyribose, just deoxyribose, yeah. That's the sugar. Ribonucleic is we, we call the whole thing. That's the whole name. But the actual sugar is just deoxyribose. Okay, we'll have a phosphate here. Phosphate, 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 phosphate. So what goes here? What are the bases that are going to be on the other side? Let's say this is going this way. And this is going... Wait, so the whole uh, one is called deoxyphosphate? Uh, well, the whole molecule is deoxyribonucleic acid, like DNA is the whole thing, uh, but the sugar itself is deoxyribose. That's why it, where it gets its name from. So, uh, yes, Sajal? Uh, it would be ACC, which is the A, C, 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 C,
into RNA. If we read this code here, and this was now RNA over here, this would be a U. Okay? And then if we were reading along this, this is now RNA here, we'd have one ACC and UGG. So which two amino acids would come in here? Let's find out. Do you know offhand? Well, we, I know like what it's going to create first. Uh, yeah, there's which one? one? Uh, it's going to do like when it codes, like the ribosome yeah. codes. Yeah. It's going to start with the codon uh, AUG, which is. Oh, yeah, like, the AUG, the start codon. We'll leave that start. out for now. That's, yeah. But if we just started with the ACC one, if that was the first one, the second, or just somewhere along the way. So we would just go along here and say A, C, C, ACC, three and E. You don't have to know this, but this is like just this is how it would work. A ribosome would say, "Let's read this one. Bring in a threonine chunk. That's an amino acid." Yes. Do we ever have ribosomes? No. Uh, even in grade twelve university, uh, you learn about what we're doing right now. You would have to memorize this table that you could look at. Okay. Yes. Um, Do we have to know which one starts? The start and stop ones. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then next we have it's a UGG, UG, UGG, tryptophan, tryptophan, famous from Turkey, actually, not the country, but the animal. All right, so this is a very short protein with a threonine and a tryptophan. Would that actually do anything? Not really. Uh, so, the, so the U is, 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 is because it's an RNA? Uh, because it's RNA, yeah. U is in the place of T. So... But that's just like a very small example of how this would work. And then why a mutation might affect this. Like what if um, if we had a mutation right here that suddenly turned this into uh, um, another C. That would make this a G. And can you just look up what would be, what would G, G, G be? Glycine. Glycine. All right. So that is a mutation that has caused a different amino acid to come in in this spot. So, oh no. Maybe. Yes. Or maybe great. Maybe it causes a better maybe thing. Maybe it makes it like, be something. A superhuman. Yes. Like, that would be just like a mutation because if there's no start, then nothing would be created. I'm, I've sort of left out the start just to avoid it being complicated. Like there, there would be a start and a stop. So there's a start and a stop for every... Yeah. Every gene needs a start place because it actually needs to tell it how, what order to read things in. And every gene creates one protein? Yeah. Well... That's sort of a simplified version. It's, there can sometimes be multiple, let's say, uh, multiple parts of a protein. That so there might be one. different genes that have to come together and make like a transformer that's going to make a big, big protein. Okay. But, but pretty much... It is, yeah. Keep, to keep it simple, one gene, ish. No, but one, one jumble protein. of protein. I mean. a one, a one sequence of like amino acids that could be a protein. Yeah. Okay. So that's the. Oh, we didn't finish it. Um, how does the DNA of a yellow perch differ from human DNA? Alex. Hi. So a yellow perch is a fish, yes. which means it has different genes compared to a human. The genes are, is a section of the DNA, mm -hmm. which the section of the DNA codes for a protein, mm -hmm. which that protein is used for the gene to create, let's say, gills or something. Okay. You wouldn't have a human who has gills, which creates different proteins. So right. since different proteins are being created, different order of the bases. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in general, though, yeah, there's a set of fish genes that are important for fish operation. And a set of human genes that are important for human operations, some of them are the same, right? There's like yeah. lung tissue and things like that, not lung necessarily, I mean, they but have different lungs. they'll have different uh, configurations. Eye they'll tissue. have a lot of the same proteins, though. Sorry, eye tissue might be similar. Sure. Would it? Yeah, similar. Similar. Um, but then there'd be things that would be unique to, to the fish and to the humans. Like All right. How would a, uni a yellow perch DNA be closer to walleye or deer? Which one would, be, would it be closer to? Walleye. Yes. Why? Because it's also a fish. Walleye is also a fish. Oh, yes, more similar. Same right. species. 